Thank you all for coming tonight in the rain. Tonight we touch on a topic that is front and center. Just Monday, the headline in the Metro section of the Washington Post was, new role for district for police body cameras. Video cameras can be used as evidence at trials in addition to protecting officers and residents. In the same vein, I and one of my colleagues, Allison Sherry, are currently seeking on behalf of the New York Post access to the grand jury proceedings in the death of Eric Garner. Everyone has seen one shocking <coughs> video. How about the other three that the grand jury saw? I want to thank NPR for providing this wonderful facility and most especially for providing our excellent moderator, Ashley Messenger. Not only is Ashley a gifted media and First Amendment lawyer at NPR, but she teaches media law and was a reporter herself. We have representatives of the press from each medium. Bill Lord, at the end there, is the station manager news director at WUSA 9, and before that, he was at WJLA for 12 years. He covered both OJ trials, really the first trial that entered our living rooms <coughs> via cameras in the court. Peter Herman, uh, two seats away from him, has the police beat at the Washington Post. His story on Monday, video shows man opening fire in Congress Heights homicide. The story went up, posted complete with surveillance video of the gunman, posted with the story. This is just the kind of thing we're going to be talking about tonight. Sam Stein in the middle there is the senior political editor at the Huffington Post, uh, and I call him my second son. Um, <laughs> he's actually my only son. Um, and he's also a regular on MSNBC. Sam was the first online news reporter called by any president at a White House press conference. Defending the press is Jim McLaughlin in the middle there, Deputy General Counsel at the Washington Post after a stint at law firm uh, private practice and as a legal fellow at the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Jim is my co-chair of the Dialogue Project and I am so very, very, very lucky. Uh, Vince Cohn, uh, over here, uh, two seats down, is a veteran prosecutor <coughs> and now the principal assistant U.S. attorney in D.C. His boss was recently quoted as saying he was, quote, optimistic about the use of body camera video. Vince has played a key role in the recent D.C. government corruption cases. Filling in for Reed Weingarten, uh, next to Vince, uh, uh, who has, Reed has come down with the flu, is Brian Heberling, Reed's partner at Steptoe and Johnson and the head of the firm's white collar criminal defense practice in DC. We are so grateful to Brian for stepping in for Reed. Brian has represented everyone from a Blackwater security guard to a BP executive to a DC homicide detective to a Naval Academy quarterback. Quite a roster. Finally, we have two members of the judiciary, both deeply engaged on, in issues related to digital evidence. They were a dynamic duo on our panel, Social Networks, Computer Technology, and the Courts at the Museum. Judge Facciola is just retired as a magistrate judge in, in the Federal District Court in DC. He is credited with many far-reaching decisions which have really set the table for electronic discovery. And Judge Dixon has served much the same role in Superior Court and has led the court's pilot projects in electronic filing and technology-enhanced courtrooms. Both judges have been in the middle of the conversation that Ashley will be leading tonight. Jim and I just can't thank our panel enough for doing this. Thank you, Laura. <clears throat> and thanks to everybody for coming tonight, welcome. Uh, the title of our panel tonight, Scholars and Scoundrels, comes from a quote from a 1986 case that was decided by the Federal Appellate Court here in DC. It's called Derns versus Bureau of Prisons. And it involved some prisoners who were seeking through FOIA requests to get their pre-sentencing reports. And in that case, the court noted that uh, the Congress had set up equal access to records for both the scholar and the scoundrel. 
Now tonight we're not talking about FOIA, but we are talking about access to information. And one of the questions that comes up is exactly how equal are we comfortable having access to information be, especially now that everything's on the internet. We live our lives on video these days. There's surveillance videos, there's personal cameras that everybody records things with, and we need to come to terms with how this information is gonna be used, how it's gonna be presented to the public, and how it's gonna be used in high profile trials. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. We've carefully selected our panelists to represent different viewpoints. Um, a thing about this style of panel is that the people here are not speaking for themselves. They are playing a role. Uh, the judges will be playing the judges. We have a prosecutor playing a prosecutor, a defense lawyer being a defense lawyer, media people being media people. And we're gonna ask them in general, what would people in your position do? Um, and so to keep in mind that this is hypothetical, <laughs> um, we are gonna start with a truly fantastical scenario. Um, we're gonna begin by supposing that the Washington DC professional football team, whatever their name happens to be, um, is going to their third straight Super Bowl. <laughs> so you can see this is truly hypothetical. <laughs> um, and how did the Washington, Washington team get to the third straight Super Bowl, you might ask? Well, on this particular night, they just happened to defeat their bitter rivals, the um, Dallas Cowboys, in the NFC Championship game here at FedEx Field. And so we are now after the game. Washington fans are celebrating throughout the area. People are overjoyed. And then there is an ugly incident on a metro train. Um, Approaching Metro Center, there's a verbal confrontation on the Orange Line train between a middle-aged white man in a cowboy shirt and three African-American youths who are wearing Washington gear. There is some conflict, there's some yelling, there's some posturing, and then all of a sudden it breaks into violence. Uh, Tex, the Cowboys fan, ends up pulling out a concealed handgun, which he has no license to carry in DC, and he fires shots towards the three young men. Fortunately, he doesn't hit all of them, he only hits one of them, and he does not hit any bystanders, but he does hit one young man named Derek. Um, he claims after the fact that he was only trying to scare the boys away and that he did not try to hurt anybody seriously. Nevertheless, Derek is seriously injured and he's taken to the hospital. Now, as you can Im imagine, on a crowded metro train, people are scared, they're freaked out, they're moving away from the scene. When the train pulls up to the platform at Metro Center, the police are ready, they, uh, there's a chaotic scene, they try to control the situation and figure out what happens. Tex gets off the train, immediately seeks out the police officers, turns over his gun, and gives his version of events, saying that he thinks he shot one of the teens, that the boy may need medical attention, and he identifies the two others that were involved in the altercation. Derek's friends, in turn, are accusing Tex of shooting him on purpose without provocation, and they demand that the police arrest Tex. Ultimately, the police place Tex, the two teens, and two other young African-American males who they mistakenly think played a role in the altercation in handcuffs. They're all ordered to lie down on the metro platform. As you can imagine, at this point, there is a crowd. <laughs> Members of the public are all pulling out their cell phones. They are recording video. They're taking photographs. They're posting it to Vine and Instagram with tags like shooting at Metro Center. And all of a sudden, these things go viral. In a matter of minutes, everybody has access to this information. As you may know, the Metropolitan Police Department has a policy that says that unless there truly is a security threat, they will not stop people from recording video. So consistent with that policy, they do not try to stop anybody from taking video. Instead, they tell people that it could perhaps be subpoenaed. It might come up later. Um, but they let the, the videos go up. After a while, order is restored. The police take into custody uh, Tex, who is placed under arrest and charged with the firearms offenses related to the um, unauthorized concealed handgun. He is not charged with anything yet related to the shooting. Uh, the four youths and the the four youths, two of whom had nothing to do with the confrontation, are all released after questioning without charges. So this is where we're beginning. For the reporters and editors, is this a big story? Do you want to write about this? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think the only question is how big the font should be on the front page. <laughs> right? So you're all over this is what you're saying. Absolutely. Well, sure. It has all the textures of a good story. There's sports. There's violence. There's, you know, all the racial elements involved. Yeah, everything that makes a good story. Plus and the Redskins you, and the Cowboys. Yeah, right. Too. And what are you going to do with the video? What do, you, do you want to do anything with all the video that's been posted to Vine or Instagram or any other social media sites? 
the first thing we would do is gather all that material up. We would verify it later, but we, we just instantly would get as much of that as we could uh, because uh, that way, once, once we have it, nobody takes it away from us. Once we publish it, uh, it's in the public domain. So uh, the first thing we do in a case like that is somebody figures out what the hashtag would be, and it would probably be a hashtag Metro shooting, and would try to gather every photo, every response, every video, and basically uh, make sure that we have all that. And then once we get a little farther down the road, we verify the authenticity of it. Now, <clears throat> as it turns out, two of the people that were detained and put on the platform turn out not to have been involved. Do you have any ethical qualms about using any of the video that shows the two that turned out not to be involved? Conceivably, yes, but uh, this is happening in a public place with uh, where, where it is being seen. So uh, as long as we find out the facts and show the, and, and report correctly that those two people were allowed to leave and had not been arrested, uh, I would be inclined to go ahead and use it. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously you wouldn't want to pinpoint them as um, suspects without verifying the role that they played there, but you have to also keep in mind that, you know, one component of the story is that people are falsely accused, and, you know, you can't just ignore that aspect of the story. So we would not hesitate to use their image and ideally the footage of them being arrested because that's a second component of the story, not just the shooting, but the fact that they were detained by police and suspected of the shooting. I think the trickiest part would be trying to very quickly verify who shot the video and how authentic it was, and then determinations would have to be made and how fast we can get it up because we're going to want to get this up very fast. My, my question for the other reporters here, I'm new, I'm the online guy, but... Um, <laughs> Presuming you have multiple videos of the same incident happening from multiple angles and multiple people, isn't that in itself some sort of verification that this incident did happen to exist? Yes, but I think we also yeah. want to know who shot the video and at least have the name of oh, yeah, the yeah, person yeah, that's who shot true. the video. Of course. And so that's not always that easy in fast-moving, fluid situations like this. And get like permission this. if there's a copy. And get permission if we <laughs> can, <Yes. laughs> Those media lawyers are such sticklers for this kind of stuff. Right. Yeah, this panel isn't about copyright, but there are so many copyright issues in here. But it is, it is, a, but it is a consideration that we, that we go through. I mean, we just don't take <clears throat> pictures off Facebook. Um, you know, even a picture taken by a professional photographer of somebody that somebody doesn't, can't give us permission to run the photograph. So all these decisions have to be <clears throat> thought out, discussed, talked over before getting it up while the web producers are screaming at us to get it up now. In a case like this, if we receive uh, a, tw a Twitter with a video attached, we immediately tweet that person back and say, may we use this video? And that's, you know, they, now you have a recorded uh, permission and uh, we get it on right away that way. Excellent. For the prosecutor, what do you want to do with this video? Anything yet? Are you hanging out for the time being? <laughs> do you want to uh, get your hands on these videos? Do you want to question anybody who's taking video? Being a lifelong Washingtonian, I would definitely have been at the game, so I need to come back <laughs> to the game and, and stop celebrating myself. But um, no, it's, it's surprising that we would probably do the same thing that the media folks would do. We'd actually go up and try and get um, all of the, the, you know, the viral uh, video um, that's on the on the net, and we'd also have our investigators go out and try and get as much as we can, pull it all together. We wouldn't be s in such a rush to put it up anywhere, but we'd also collect it as well because it's going to be evidence, and we're going to look at it and review it and try to identify witnesses and go out, and that'll be the start of our investigation. So we would actually do something that's consistent with what the media would do at that time. All right, and for our judges, there's no case pending yet, but... Surely, as judges, there's something going through your mind when you see breaking news events with video everywhere. What are you thinking? I wonder who's going to be assigned this case. <laughs> are you uh, praying it's not you? <laughs> oh, yes. I'm, I'm thinking, gee, I'm glad I retired. <laughs> <laughs> are uh, you predicting any specific concerns? The one concern that naturally occurs is the one about the pretrial publicity, because that's even magnified and enhanced by virtue of social media publications now. I would be thinking, uh, very much like the reporters, I would, and as would Vince would be thinking, I'd be worrying about authenticity. <clears throat> Where did this stuff come from? Where was this person positioned? 
is this an accurate way? Was this person positioned in a way in that uh, what we're seeing on the video is really not what actually occurred? Those are the kind of questions that are in the back of my mind. I think th this new area of the authenticity of digital evidence is becoming more and more important. Okay, super. So we're going to move on with our hypothetical here. We're now several weeks after the shooting. Derek is still in the hospital. He had a bullet <laughs> removed from near his spine, and it's unclear if he's ever going to be able to walk again. But as it turns out, Derek is not just any Washington sports fan. He happens to be the son of the D.C. mayor. Uh, <laughs> So the incident has attracted national attention. Everybody is interested in this. And a grand jury is examining whether Tex, who is still in custody, should be charged with um, any, anything in connection with the shooting. He says that he acted in self-defense. Um, it is unknown whether the grand jury is also considering assault charges against the teens. There's an ambitious young reporter at a publication called the Washington Herald, and she learns from a trusted source that in addition to all the videos that have been posted online already, there's at least one cell phone video from inside the train that possibly shows the altercation in the shooting, and it's been obtained by police investigators. Perhaps it has been introduced as an exhibit to the grand jury. Not surprisingly, the reporter for the Washington Herald wants this video. How about the other reporters? Do you want this video? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> um, are you, do you think you're going to get it? Probably not from the police, but we would make every effort to find who shot it and where it might be posted and how we might acquire it by less than official means. So I'm going to ask the media lawyer, um, do you think you can get this for your clients? Is there any way? No, not at this stage. Um, I suppose you could put in a FOIA request for it if it's been obtained by MPD. It's part of their investigative file, but um, uh, it's going to be denied, I think, on the basis of the ongoing investigation exemption. You still might want to put it in because you never know, and you also at least get the, the, you know, the clock moving for if circumstances change and you need to appeal it quickly. Um, I guess I'd also uh, be looking at the possibility of some sort of motion to the grand jury, for access to the grand jury materials. Mm -hmm. But while the grand jury is pending, and even <coughs> after it's finished its business, that's going to be probably an uphill battle, to say Now, the at this point, Tex probably has a defense lawyer. What do you think about this purported video? Well, so I have a different problem than Vince. Uh, as a lifeline New York Giants fan, and one who <laughs> uh, favors DC gun laws, I have some issues with Tex, but I don't turn away a client. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, of course I want to see what this video shows, and uh, I think my best way of going about doing that is having a dialogue with Vince. Um, you know, uh, my experience with the U.S. Attorney's Office has an open mind. Um, I want to know what they have. I'm going to go in and, and talk to him and, and try to get my client's version of events out there, but, um, you know, part of it is if they're interested in a deal and they think they have the evidence to uh, prosecute my client, I want to see what it is, and it's up to them, but, um, you know, my experience, if they think they have a case, they're going to they're going to show me and encourage me to take uh, a deal for my client. Now, not knowing what's on the video yet, how do you feel about the reporters getting it? Do you want it public? No, I don't want it public. <laughs> um, um, I, you know, the scenarios you've described it, um, there's going to be a lot of publicity anyway. I want to do whatever I can to minimize additional publicity. So I'm not out on the, the speaking circuit. I'm not hitting the Today Show. None of that is in my client's interest, um, and I just assume the press never get a copy of the video, or at least not at this stage of the case. And do you share that attitude? I do. This is one of the situations where, I mean, we have to do a balancing test, the adverse impact to the investigation. <clears throat> if we release this tape at this time, um, there's a chance that, you know, witnesses' recollections <coughs> could be tainted. Um, there's witness security issues. Um, you know, Brian's Clients' rights are also at stake. We don't want to make sure that the, the, the grand jurors, if they're not already seated, seated, will be impartial, or the pettit jurors may be you know, persuaded to think one thing or the other if they see the video. So there's a lot of interest that we kind of take into consideration. We also have the DC Crime Victim Rights Act, and we have to make sure that we, Derek's family, we speak to the, the mayor, I guess it would be in this case, and his, his wife, and see what their views are about you know, releasing the you know, the, the tape and finding out what the media wants to do and that sort of thing. So we have to keep that in consideration as well because the D.C. Crime Victim Rights Act requires us and obligates us to do so. 
Excellent. Now, as you can imagine, the public has um, paid a lot of attention to this case, and everybody wants to know what happened. So now with the internet, we have Reddit forums, and people are on Reddit scanning all these videos trying to figure out what happened. And they're looking for evidence, and they're trying to see if they know anything about this case that can be contributed to the public discussion. So we've got this Reddit forum, and somebody posts a video to YouTube that purports to show Tex at a sports bar. He's drinking heavily, he's watching the championship game, and he's shouting at the television. And and it appears, it sounds like maybe, it's hard to tell, but maybe in this video he uses a racial slur at one point. And the video has been posted by a person who noticed after the fact that they had just been, you know, using their phone, taking pictures of their friends, and they caught this video of text in the background doing this. It's been posted online and people at Reddit are going through arguing that this proves that he was out to shoot those kids. So back to the reporters. Do you want to use this video? No way. <laughs> we would be very careful with something like that. No, that's um, insane. No. Well, there's just no there's no reliability to a Reddit post like that. And there's been too many instances of videos being doctored and Reddit being completely and terribly wrong. I like Reddit for what it's worth, but mm -hmm. it's not reliable as a source independent. If we could find the person who shot that video and could verify its authenticity and go back and talk to witnesses who were there and see if anyone else heard this and things like that, which is something we might try to do. Uh, you might make a case for using some of it, but yeah, I would it send, would be a very, very long yeah, shot. I, I would send someone out, I would send a reporter out to the bar and talk to the bartender to see if he had any recollection of what they were talking about. You'd have to independently confirm anything like that. I think you'd also try to put it in the context of what happened on the, tr on the train as well, did if that happened in the bar, did that continue on the train? Is that part of the, the story of the, of the people who were shot? And if that all, if you can get the interview and if it all fits in the context, then you can start to think about whether you want to use this or not. But I think we would tread very, very carefully. Interesting um, I, question. I would make an argument to the defense lawyer that if the that video that the police have does show an altercation, it would help his side of things by sharing it with us. It doesn't appear that that argument will work, though. But <laughs> with, with, the the <laughs> with the prosecutors, would the prosecutors use this video? Well, that's a good question. Would the prosecutors use this video? Um, we would definitely get it. Um, we would try and corroborate every part of it and try and see what the source was and identify what's going on. It seems to me, at least the um, uh, in the hypothetical, it seemed to me like there, were, there was going to be a claim of self-defense. So that's something that we have to investigate and make sure that it either was self-defense or it wasn't. And I think that video would help us at least, uh, it would be a start there. And again, we'd have to corroborate it and make sure that it's authentic and that sort of thing. But we'd gather it as a part of our investigative steps. Do the judges have any concerns about this video? While our traditional journalists might have a hesitation about using it, I have no doubt, having been posted on Reddit and other types of social media, the defense attorneys will have it. And I will be faced with the question, even though the traditional press has not publicized this information, of whether or not this type of evidence is going to be admissible in this trial. So the, the citizen journalist has, has changed the dynamics of everything. It's not so much the, the uh, ethical uh, prohibitions that the traditional journalists might follow. We have folks with a a laptop, a tablet, or a smartphone, and they will put anything out there, and the judges will have to deal with it. So would this be admissible evidence? Uh, it, it, you certainly cannot tell now. Yes, yeah, That's, that's Brian's early. call. Remember, you can't assume self-defense is the defense in this case. Brian may keep his guy off the stand, in which case this, this video is absolutely irrelevant. And I'm concerned as a judge that nevertheless it's going to hit the, it's going to get out there, and the next thing you know, my potential jurors have all sent something that I'm about to rule as inadmissible. So it's, it's, it's a dangerous proposition. It's certainly not true that this, this video is going to get anywhere into evidence until Brian makes his move. And are you going to do anything with this video? Well, it's certainly, you know, uh, doing my due diligence. I'm, I want to know, you know what's in the video. It, it'll help me evaluate the strength of my case. It's certainly relevant. If it have, is of suspect authenticity, you know, I, I certainly um, can't control the, uh, some of the more suspect elements of the media. I find it, you know, very unfortunate if it gets wide publicity for the reasons the judge said. This may never hit the um, you know, trial in any way, but my jury pool, if this gets repeated play, um, may well be familiar with it, and it could disqualify a significant uh, portion of the panel. You know, Anyone who's been exposed to this video, if, if it's not likely to come into evidence, or, or even if it may, 
they could have preconceived notions about the case. And uh, so I'm very concerned if this video gets wide play in the media. Now, we also have another social media post. Uh, Jason <clears throat> is a Facebook friend of Derek, and Jason happens to be a Cowboys fan. Before the game, Derek posted a profanity-laced rant on Facebook about hating Cowboys fans, and there were some ambiguous, possibly threatening overtones. You know how things on social media, you can't really tell what people's intentions are, you can't read the tone, and so maybe, maybe not, he was making threats about Cowboys fans. After the shooting, Jason shared Derek's post on his own page with a note that said, not surprised the kid got shot. So some of Jason's Facebook friends copied the post, quoted on social media sites, argued that it showed that Derek was looking for a fight. The post is then picked up by several online sites and it goes viral. Wait, Jason's a friend and he posted that? About Facebook it, uh, friends. Your Facebook friends, friends, friends aren't okay. necessarily your friends. <laughs> I was gonna say, that's Let's rough. Let's be clear about that. <laughs> Derek needs new Facebook friends. <laughs> so do you want to use this in any way in your reporting? Yeah, I'll use that. Yes, I, I think it's relevant. And it also, and, and this is a big question based on this entire discussion, at what point do we determine that any of this is necessarily going to prejudice a jury? Because obviously in the last five years, the explosion of video has put all of these uh, crimes on television long before there's an arrest, long before there's a grand jury, long before there's a court case. Has it affected any of the, uh, the cases to the point where people feel as though uh, the jury has been prejudiced? But I, I mean, we're, we're spending a lot of time parsing whether we would run this or whether we wouldn't run it and how careful. While we're parsing this, all the stuff is out there and being discussed regardless if it's in the pages of the Washington Post or on television or any, it doesn't matter anymore. It's, it's out there, it's online, and whether we in the traditional media are part of that discussion or not, it's there, and what we're getting now is complaints from readers wondering why aren't we reporting what they're seeing on the internet. That's right, because why, principles of journalism- Why we've all watched this video, why aren't you talking about it? And then we'll become the, the story about should we even write about the video, which is another backdoor way of writing about the video without <laughs> writing about the video. But it will, become, it will become that because eventually it will become a question It'll be for, the, for the to trial. The, to the motion to transfer. It, it will. It eventually it's going to make it into a court file, and then we're all going to feel better about ourselves because we're writing about it. But it's out there. It doesn't matter what we do anymore. And That's not true. Yeah, That's not true. You, you're adding the Washington Post's legitimacy to that Facebook post if you decide to print it in that moment. And true. I mean, I think that doesn't, that's not for, I mean, we're competitors, but that's not for nothing. You know, I, I, Washington Post is a valid institution, and they give it a sense of legitimacy if they write about it. And but when traditional media the, adheres the, to journalism ethics and the online people don't adhere to journalism well, ethics, I'm that's online, where you get the conflict. Yeah. We, uh, oh, I don't mean you. Okay, I, yeah, mean yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean Reddit. I mean Reddit and Facebook. Okay. Normal people who are posting stuff, sure. they, don't, they don't necessarily adhere to journalism ethics, right? So what, how does that affect you? Me? You oh, it, I think it affects us every day. I mean, yeah. we, we decide whether we're going to, you know, repeat something or link to something or yeah. put something up or claim ownership to it. And yes, it does matter <coughs> when we put the brand behind it, but it doesn't change the fact that well, to the point, to tens Peter, of thousands yeah. or hundreds of thousands or millions of people are, sure. are looking at this on their own accord with or without the Washington Post. I, I think anything. to Peter's point, it's like sometimes uh, there's enough social pressure that builds up around a story like this hypothetical that it becomes much more difficult not to cover it uh, and those editorial decisions that we make become a lot more difficult to execute um, but that we st we're still required to make them obviously and there's been plenty of instances where we've decided not to run things because it just didn't fit our standards. Uh, but you're right. I mean, you're sort of just putting your head in the sand at some point saying, oh, well, you know, we're not going to run this, but everyone else in the universe knows about it. Yeah. At some point where the discussion is happening around us and we're not part of it anymore, which is antithetical to what we're That's true trying too. to do. Yeah. So for the prosecutor and the defense lawyer, how do you feel about the Facebook post? Is this something that's helpful to you? Do you want it out there? Do you not want it out there? Does it affect anything that you've done so far? So um, if it's as described, it's uh, helpful to me, uh, but I don't want it out there necessarily. I mean, my audience is not uh, the media, the, the public, in any significant way. My audience is Vince, and 
um, the people in his office who are going to decide whether to prosecute the case. So I want the information and I want to use it, but I want to use it responsibly. And, and I don't want to perpetuate you know, the story, even if an element of it is favorable to me uh, or my client, because it will just regurgitate the story and, and continue to um, you know, cause it to have a life of its own. So it's relevant, but I want to use it with the right audience. I think that's right as well. I mean, we, we are not going to be <clears throat> interested in, and again, I want to make sure everyone heard me correctly, this is during the investigative stage where we want to gather all of this information. It's not a little different when we get to trial and we start trying to put it into evidence. I mean, there's some authentication issues and all of that that we need to work through. But with respect to gathering it, um, it's, it's better for less information to be out there on a case. Again, you're talking about impartiality. You want to make sure that your grand jurors and your jury pool are actually seeing the evidence that is being presented in those four corners of that courtroom or the four corners of that grand jury room at the time that they are hearing the information so that they can make a decision on that as opposed to what they talk to their friends about, what they see on, on, on Facebook and that sort of thing. So it, our preference would be that it not be up there, but if it's up there, we're going to get it and try and investigate it. Super. So now here we are several months later and the grand jury reaches its decision. <clears throat> Tex is going to be charged with attempted murder and reckless endangerment in addition to the firearms charges that were already pending. So Derek and the other teens are not charged at all despite the fact that Tex claims that they assaulted him. In general, the reaction in D.C. is positive. People believe that any further charges would have been unjust. And now that the grand jury has reached its decision, the U.S. Attorney's Office is under enormous public pressure to make the evidence that the grand jury used available. Some in the news media note that in the Ferguson, Missouri shooting of Michael Brown, dozens of volumes of grand jury testimony and exhibits were released to the public after the grand jury decided not to indict. So to the judges and the prosecutors here, and you can go in whatever order you feel comfortable with, how, do you want this information to be released now that the grand jury has decided to charge him? I would have to think that in terms of the expressions by the prosecutor and defense attorney, uh, most judges would prefer for there to be as little po publicity as possible because publicity brings about issues that have to be addressed, issues about jury being tainted, uh, issues with respect to evidence that's available supposedly from from social media that's not being used or that that is being used every ounce of publicity that occurs brings a different issue that has to be addressed within the courtroom and obviously a motion made by anyone to get this stuff is going to be denied because under rule 60 of the rules federal rules of criminal procedure it is a matter occurring before the grand jury and FOIA incorporates that standard so there's no hope of any lawsuit trying to get this stuff, even though it seems odd because it has all come from other sources. So I, I, I think that motion dies before the day it's filed. Would the prosecutor release it on your own initiative? Do you have any motive to do that? No, we know better. Um, <laughs> we, need, we need a court order to do so. So I mean, um, you know, we would also, again, if there was a, a request for it, a motion made in the court, we would oppose it most likely due to the, again, Crime Victim Rights Act, I'm sure. You know, the mayor and the mayor's wife, does not, they don't want to necessarily watch their son being shot over and over again on every, you know, every uh, uh, Facebook and every website that's out there. Um, we'd also have, obviously, some concerns about witness safety and that sort of thing. So we'd make all of those arguments to the court. And um, as you heard what Judge Fasciola said, it probably would not be a winning proposition with respect to the media getting that information. I, if I could just add, um, we would be watching very carefully to see when these materials are f attached, as, if at all, as exhibits to court pleadings, because at that point, there is a, a presumption mm -hmm. under the First Amendment of access to them. It can potentially be rebutted if there are true uh, concerns, but at that point, it's in a very different posture from if it's just been ex you know, shown to the grand jury and not yet presented to the court. Now, it'd be nice to have the testimony, but what everybody really wants is the video. Right. Now, is there any way that any of you over here on the justice side <laughs> <laughs> want to see the videos that supported <clears throat> the decision to indict? Do you want that out there at all? Especially you. You're the defense lawyer. What if the video from inside the Metro car shows provocation? Well, um, then I'm going to use it at trial. But no, I don't want it out there. Um, you know, I'm not trying this case in, in the public arena. That does me no good, uh, but draw greater attention to the case and, um, you know, uh, potentially diminish my jury pool. Of course, I want the information, um, but I'm going to get that in discovery. Uh, I don't want it publicized, and I agree with, you know, what everyone has said. There's absolutely no basis for the media to get it. Um, Brian's no fun. Case. <laughs> they said you're no fun. 
be more open. Now, do you guys want it? <laughs> well, of I'll course. Talk to background. We, we want it. But you have to think back to the Ferguson case when they decided not to indict. They released a lot of documents. Had they decided to indict, we would still be waiting to see those documents until the trial were over. Do you think anybody's going to leak them to you? No. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would find that uh, highly unlikely. Uh, and Jim, is there anything you can do to help your clients get them at this stage? Well, if are we talking about videos that have not been, obviously have not been made available online? Um, <clears throat> at this stage, if they haven't been attached to pleadings or presented to the court in some way, um, you know, as I said before, we would look at a possible motion for access to the grand jury materials, but typically that motion is going to be a lot stronger when the grand jury has chosen not to indict because the case is now over, and there is not a, the same um, threat to fair trial rights. So um, at this point, you know, we, we would have probably have put in multiple different public records requests to the law enforcement agencies, fully expecting that they're not going to go anywhere for now. Um, but we're waiting for the moment when this is presented to the court or played in court, and we have much stronger access. <clears throat> Great, well then let's get to the trial. <laughs> um, so about six months later, jury selection's about to begin. The case is pending in DC Superior Court. Texas lawyers have of course made a motion to change venue because no diehard Cowboys fan is gonna get a fair trial in DC, <laughs> they argue. Uh, but the judges reject that. Uh, they say that there's as many fans in other places as there would be uh, in the district. And in any event, voir dire is capable of weeding out the jurors who have been unduly influenced. So the, the trial's gonna take place here in DC and it's attempted murder and reckless endangerment charges. And then on Friday afternoon, with jury selection to begin Monday morning, we find out that Zoe Barnes, the Herald reporter that we talked about before, <laughs> she Zoe. has gotten a copy of the video from inside the subway car that has been rumored to exist. And it turns out it's not a cell phone video like everybody thought. It's a video from a police body cam. As it turns out, an off-duty police officer was on the train at the time of the altercation. He happened to have his camera with him. He instinctively activated it once he saw the confrontation begin between the opposing team's fans. He didn't take any other action on the train because it happened too quickly, but he did record the incident and he immediately provided the camera to the officers who responded to the scene. That's how they got it. <laughs> So um, the important thing about this video is that the body cam video calls into question the prosecutor's case. It seems to show that Tex over, I'm sorry, it seems to show that Derek was moving towards Tex with some sort of blunt object in a threatening or menacing way, and that Tex was backing off and fired at the boys as he was trying to get out of the way. So for the reporters and editors here, do you want this video now? Oh, yes. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. And um, do you want to do anything with it? Do you want to authenticate it? Do you have any ethical concerns? How are you going to approach well, this video? I am going to presume that it has been authenticated because you know who shot it, you know that it has been introduced into evidence, and you know that it's, it's legitimate. The interesting thing in cases like this, and there are no <coughs> law enforcement people here to defend themselves, but uh, in many of these cases, the, uh, the dashboard camera or the body cameras if it shows a point of view that the police are happy with, they'll release it. If it shows a point of view that they're not happy with, uh, it's very hard to get a hold of. So uh, I don't know if that's relevant in this case, but there seems to be something of a double standard about how these things are released to the media. And you can, you can if you were to run the video, you, you could obviously put that context around the presentation of the video, but you would still run the video. Yeah, if you could get it, you'd run it. Yeah. If you could get it. And at this point, all you know is that somebody leaked it to a competing <coughs> publication saying that it was a body cam video. Do you know for sure that it was, in fact? We would probably credit the publication and give them you know, kudos for the scoop and then put all the ethical onus on them. <laughs> <laughs> Being honest. <laughs> I applaud little, your honesty. A little more honest than you needed to be, but he's, he's absolutely right. And, <laughs> As a media lawyer, do you have any concerns about using this video? Do you have any concerns about the characterization of what's happening in the video? The concern would be authenticating it. And um, if we were able to authenticate it, report it out, seek comment from anybody who's shown on the video in a defamatory way, which, which could be both texts and the, the, um, the youths. And there may be an issue, depending on how old the, the kids are, you know, whether there's a 
a minor issue, but if they're, you know, in a public place, and this was obviously a highly newsworthy event, I think if we were able to authenticate it, uh, we would publish it. Okay. There are a couple of other issues. One is, how did this police video happen to land in the hands of a reporter? Uh, because the defense at this point would be claiming that the prosecutor has attempted to taint the proceedings by releasing uh, this, this type of information, that is assuming that it's helpful to the, to the prosecution. Secondly, if it's helpful to the defense, I'm assuming that the defense has made what's called a Brady demand, that is for evidence that's favorable to the defense. Uh, and if the defense has not received it, uh, that's another issue that's going to have to be addressed because the question is whether or not the prosecutor violated its obligation under Brady to turn over favorable evidence to the defense. The third thing that I want to mention, because I have no idea how the law is going to involve, evolve in this issue, we're talking about authentication. If we look at present day evidence, uh, you can take a photograph that was not taken by the witness show it to the witness, ask the witness does it accurately describe the scene as it existed on that occasion, uh, and under at least current law with respect to that witness who had nothing to do with the photograph, it's admissible. What if, and it's just a question, what if you have a series of witnesses who see this video and each testify that it is accurate, it fully portrays, I'm not sure that authentication question uh, is is dire as it's being described, and you know we're just going to have to wait to see how the law develops. Hmm. Okay. Well, and I, I I agree. I mean, the the point, the problem that Herb and I now have immediately is what, if anything, we're we going to do about attempting the source of the leak, because if it was nefarious, if it was done for an improper purpose, we have the possibility the whole prosecution has been tainted, and Brian's going to be screaming like a like crazy that they did this purposefully, and then I've got this whole subsidiary issue I'm going to have to explore. Let me just jump in here real quick. Um, so the rights of the media and the rights that the defendant have are completely different coming from our perspective. Brian would already have this information. He already had the video. It would not be a surprise to him on the eve of trial for him to get a video. And if he does get it at the, on the eve of trial, I know Brian, we've tried cases against him. He would have made this, um, you know, his Brady demand a long time ago and he would have been screaming to Judge Faciolo, <coughs> excuse me, Judge Faciolo and Judge Dixon a long time ago. So he would have the cake. He would already have the um, video because according to the hypo, the video has some exculpatory information in it. So I think, you know, it's, it's just a different obligation that we have to the defendant as it is to the media. And I want to make sure that we are separating the two at this point. Can I at least mention, though, that as a trial judge leading up to trial, I have to deal with Brady issues all the time <clears throat> because the defense is claiming that this favorable information that would have exculpated their client, they did not receive. So I, I know that the prosecutor generally tries to follow that obligation, but I still have that <laughs> issue that I have to address quite often. And, it's, and it, it, it may lead me, not to dismiss, but it may lead me to, to grant Brian's motion for a continuance. So some time can yeah. go by, we can sort this out and the potential prejudice can dissipate among the jury pool. I'm glad you asked that, because that was actually one of my next questions. Does it make a difference when this comes out? Does it matter yeah. to you that it comes out now? If it come out six months earlier, would that be better? Because then time passes and the, and yeah. the potential prejudice I, I think dissipates. one of the, the in, as, as Herb and I confront the Brady issue and, and, and we have to focus on the practical consequences of what occur, the greater the time between its disclosure and the trial, the easier it is to conclude there's been no prejudice. And given the, the life cycle yeah. we live in, anything <laughs> that survives for 24 <laughs> hours is ancient. <laughs> and one other thing I'd like to point out, I remember when Judge Sirica was, uh, was selecting the jury with respect to the Watergate case, he expressed amazement that there were some potential members of the jurors, jury who'd never heard of Watergate. Yeah. Well, so another example, uh, and this is real because it occurred, uh, I, I remember once there was a headline in the Washington Post in a trial that had just started uh, with respect, and it said Teflon defendant. It was above the fold on the front page. Most of the seated jurors had not read the Washington Post, so yeah. the judge was able to proceed. Yeah. There are those that's, issues. Yeah. That's an argument we, I mean, it, it, it's embarrassing in some ways for us, but it's, <laughs> it's an argument that, uh, that I find myself making as a media lawyer when the argument is that uh, for sealing something or closing a proceeding is that you, you know, the, the impact of pretrial publicity will make it impossible to select yeah. a, a jury. 
you know, there are cases like the Watergate case yes. where it's actually not as hard as you might think to find people who haven't paid any attention to yeah, it. I, I can top that. Rihanna made an album, and <laughs> Paul McCartney plays on it all over Facebook. Who's Paul McCartney? <laughs> <laughs> Kids these days. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it, does anybody want to inst instigate a leak investigation here? I do. <laughs> um, yeah, I absolutely do. And, you know, the first thing, even, even though you've described it as a video that, um, you know, appears to be exculpatory for my client, this coming out on the eve of jury selection is a disaster for me. Um, you know, if, if literally this comes out, you know, the weekend before, the Monday morning before, um, and it's, this case is as sensational as you've described it, you know, it, it taints uh, a large number of the jury pool. People who may uh, be jurors I wanted to have on, the pool, and if they've seen this video and they've drawn some conclusion that, you know, my client's um, innocent, uh, Vince is going to be seeking to disqualify those folks. So I'm immediately going to ask for a continuance. I don't think jury selection can go forward on Monday. Um, you know, we're going to need several months of cooling off. And in the meantime, you know, I want to know: Did um, a prosecutor leak the video? Did an agent leak the video? And what were the motivations? And I may be able to get some relief, um, either excluding evidence or, um, you know, possibly greater sanctions. Are, is, would either the prosecutor or the defense lawyer be concerned at all that this is a video that came from a police body cam? Does that raise any issues at all, or is this just like any other video out there? No, no question. Look, we're, we're trying to get it right from the beginning, okay? So if there's a video out there that was on a on a police on on a police uh, uh, on police cam, and we did not get that during the investigation and did not know about that until literally the eve of trial, then we have to step back and reassess our case, reassess what, what was been into the grand jury, and reassess the actual, the, the, the ability to move forward at this stage, because that means who knows what other videos are out there that we didn't get. Well, presumably you would have had this, because this would have gone to the grand jury, it just wasn't public until right before trial. Okay, well in that case, then I understand what Judge Dixon is saying, but I really think Brian would have it by that point. So then it wouldn't be in terms of the, 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 the detriment to his client, it wouldn't be as great because he would have had it, we probably would have been talking about it through those um, you know, in-conference meetings that we have before trials and that sort of thing. So I don't think the detriment to the defendant would be that great if he was given it, uh, given, it was given to him in a timely manner. Now this video probably would have been used at trial. Maybe somebody would have tried to get it used at trial. Would you be trying to use this at trial? I think I would, as you've described it. Um, you know, if it shows the um, alleged victim coming at my client in an aggressive manner in my defense is self-defense, this sounds like um, some pretty core evidence I'd want to use. So this video probably would have been introduced into evidence the next week anyway. Does it matter to you that it comes out right before trial starts? It does, um, and it matters because of the jury selection process. Um, you know, the whole uh, right to a fair trial is, um, de it depends on impartial jurors. And, you know, I don't want any of the prospective jurors to have prejudged the case. I don't, you know, if they've seen this video and they respond truthfully in voir dire that, um, it influenced them. They may otherwise have been jurors that I wanted to, to have, you know, judge the case, but Vince would have a good argument that, uh, you know, they wouldn't be fair and impartial. So, um, I, you know, I'm not gaining anything from this exculpatory video being leaked on the eve of trial, um, even if it's going to be a centerpiece of my defense. Any other comments from the judges? Okay, now let's just mess with this whole hypothetical for a minute and say, <laughs> what if instead of this being a video that was a police <clears throat> body cam, it was actually just a regular person on the train who caught it on their camera at the time the altercation occurred and immediately posted it to Vine or Instagram, just like all those other videos right up front at the beginning. Does that change anybody's decision making through this process? I don't think it changes the media perspective at all. Except we'd want, we, there might be a little bit more, you know, we would probably want to have to go through a few more channels to confirm the authenticity as opposed to having... And we wouldn't have a the, the sort of the threat of a leak investigation hanging yeah. over our heads. Well, that's true, too, yeah. But there is some, like, I, I don't know what it is, but the fact that if, if it came from a police body cam, it does add sort of this institutional legitimacy to it that isn't there if it's just some random person posting it on Vine. But I, I think this, this raises another issue that Herb and I are going to be losing a lot of sleep over is... <coughs> are my jurors going to start doing their own investigating by going on the internet and seeing what they can find? Mm -hmm. right. And as we can tell you, all of us can tell you, there have been several trials in America that have been aborted six or seven weeks into the trial because a juror went in and investigated the internet. 
So I'm thinking before this trial starts, I've got to talk to this jury and I've got to have a very clear understanding with them that they're only going to listen to what they get in court and not investigate that. This is a, it is a, a very, very difficult problem. So how about for our lawyers here? Are you, if this had been posted right at the beginning, if the video had come out from the start, would anything have changed for either of you? Well, I think, you know, it wouldn't have had as great an impact on jury selection, um, you know, it was right on the eve of trial. I, I would want, you know, as I want in, ev in every case, to have a very extensive voir dire process given the publicity here. Um, I strongly favor written jury questionnaires. I want to know uh, from the jurors, you know, any bit of social media they've seen about the case, any video they've seen about the case. I want the judge to um, conduct individual voir dire following up on the questionnaire to fully address whether any of this stuff out there has um, caused them to prejudge the case. And so, um, you know, the fact that it's out there early um, means there's not this crisis on the eve of trial, but it, it leads me to affect uh, how, you know, I, I want voir dire conducted. Uh, I may want, you know, additional alternates. And I completely agree with Judge Facciola. I would want a very strong um, no social media instruction uh, at the outset of jury selection. And you know, they're, in every trial I've had recently, they're given, they're detailed. You know, they instruct jurors, you're not to email, text, blog, <coughs> Twitter, you can't um, you know, use Facebook, YouTube. And you know, they actually name all the various social media outlets out there. Once a jury's seated, I want them reminded again, obviously in the final instructions. And you know, in my most recent trial, the jury was instructed every day when we adjourned for the day um, it was Judge Lambert. I'm not sure he was completely up in the technology, but you know, he told them every um, day as they departed the courtroom, "Don't Twitter or tweet." And you know, they laughed every day. Uh, but you know, it had effect. I mean, it, it was a constant reminder: do not go out and do research about the trial, um, which is just critical. And it is, and from a prosecutor's perspective, it is going to change um, our view, and we're probably going to ask for continuance, get back to the office, and kibitz on it because one of the Things that Tech said apparently when he first when he gave up his gun to the Metro Police on the platform was, you know, I shot him because they were coming after me or jumping me or something of that nature. And what we would have done is investigate because we have that information very early on. We have to disprove a self-defense claim beyond a reasonable doubt. So we, that's part of our decision to charge. And if if something comes out that exculpatory right before trial. We need to get back to the office, see what's going on, try to investigate it. So we'd be asking for a continuance at least long enough to do that. And then we'd probably have some discussions with Brian about where we go from here. Okay, now say we're back in our hypothetical where this comes out right before trial and it's been leaked. For the media lawyer, are you, are you really concerned about a leak investigation or is this like a hypothetical concern? No, it's a, it's a legitimate concern if we're the, the herald um, and we're the ones who got it. Um, uh, you know, we, we, it doesn't really affect our publication decision, I don't think, but um, absolutely we're thinking there is a, a strong likelihood, especially given the eve of trial timing of, of a leak investigation and a subpoena. And so what would you do? Well, we'd preserve any records um, that relate to it. We'd, um, uh, you know, we, if it's in D.C. Uh, Superior Court, we would have an absolute privilege under the D.C. Shield Law. So. If it's in federal court, um, as you know, we, we don't have as good an argument. Um, but, you know, we just uh, sort of hunker down and uh, hope that um, if there is a leak investigation, uh, all other alternatives are exhausted before they come and subpoena the reporter because you would hope that uh, an extensive effort would be made first to find out through direct investigation who leaked it to the, to the journalist before you bring the journalist in and try to get her testimony. I'm glad that he just confirmed what I knew would happen. That is, I don't want to reveal my sources, and therefore we, we're stuck with trying to enforce some issues uh, over some parties who are objecting to quite an extent. Excellent. So now we are in the trial. The trial is underway. As in many high-profile criminal trial <coughs> cases, everybody wants to know what they're going to be able to get access to with respect to the documentary exhibits that are used. So a coalition of news organizations has prepared a motion to intervene to assert their First Amendment right of access uh, and common law right of access to the exhibits. Um, as you may know, exhibits presumptively become public records the moment they're introduced into evidence unless there is some overriding circumstance. And the news organizations, the reporters, presumably want to have the ability to inspect and publish some of the things that will be used at trial. 
So for the media lawyer, what are you going to do? How are you going to go about trying to get this information? Ideally, we would in a big trial like this, we would try to engage the court in advance and see if there's a media plan. Um, recently, in some of the better organized high-profile trials, there will be a, some sort of dialogue about what the arrangements will be for evidence uh, in advance so you're not sort of waiting with your draft motion ready to file it on the first or second day of trial. Uh, it saves everybody time and, and effort if you can try to figure out what, what the plan is going to be. Um, that said, I mean, there, in a lot of these cases recently, we have had to file motions, um, and uh, it is a contemporaneous right of access, but, uh, you know, reasonably speaking, we realize that it may not be possible to get us access to the exhibits the moment they're introduced into evidence, and uh, the, the question often will be, what's a reasonable compromise? And so for the judges, do you have a plan? And if so, what is it? Well, I'm sure we'll devise a plan. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the first thing I'm sure we'll, we will do is uh, hear from defense counsel and, and, and the prosecution uh, in terms of uh, what, if any, prejudice do they see from releasing this, this, this evidence uh, right away. I have to comment, some of the better organized public relations uh, efforts uh, distributed the videos immediately. So I, I guess those of us that don't distribute them immediately, we're less organized and, <laughs> and people will question that. If the prosecution or defense raises uh, a significant issue with respect to the distribution of those exhibits uh, immediately uh, and, and the explanations are satisfying, we would make arrangements to distribute them at a later time if there is no uh, articulable issue that either side can raise, uh, then we would make arrangements to distribute them as soon as possible. Now, the reporters might want to theoretically um, get the information out literally as quickly as possible, meaning they might want to tweet from the courtroom or use other social media from the courtroom. Would, would you allow that, or would you think it's judges It's not for in me to allow it or disallow it. There is a rule by the Administrative Office of the United Courts that prohibits any kind of publishing from the courthouse that's, that's simultaneous with this. So if you, as you remember in the Liddy case, uh, we created that media room on the first <coughs> floor. And to my knowledge, we opened that to internet access so the reporters could... Yeah, and all, that worked well. And that worked yeah. well. Uh, so uh, <coughs> it's nothing that Herb and I have any control over. It's a matter of, of law. We cannot permit it. And it, I think most courts have held that tweeting from the courthouse is a form of publication that falls within the ban of the rule. Now, for the reporters and the editors, what information from this trial do you want, if anything? Do you want everything? Do you want to post everything? Are you going to carefully curate it? How are you going to approach all the evidence? Well, I think we're going to want the video evidence most immediately. And when we do that, we set up a distribution amplifier, <clears throat> satellite trucks, all kinds of uh, electronic equipment so that everybody, all the different stations and newspapers and uh, websites, get the material at the exact same moment. Uh, that way, uh, we're, we're fair, we're presenting it all. With documents, obviously, it's a different case because they distribute the documents as a, in written form, and we have to individually, as news organizations, go through those. But any kind of visual evidence, uh, we are prepared, and we have longstanding agreements to distribute that equally at the exact same moment. Now, a lot of the videos that might be introduced in this case have already been made public, mm -hmm. that they're already out there somewhere on the internet. Rather than trying to get the official copy from the court, would you just be like, oh, they talked about this one and link to it, the pre-existing well, we, copy? Well, we would already have those, so yeah. we would probably <coughs> bypass those and only distribute material that we did not already we, have. We would probably do it a bit different than this. I think this is sort of the difference between television and, and online and probably print and online, which, you know, presuming this is a incredibly high profile case, massive public interest, huge viewership for the material, we would probably would set up a reverse chronological blog in essence and any bit of material that came out of the court we would put up online, allow our readers to sort through it in their own capacity. Um, for big documents, uh, we would probably post those online as soon as possible, let our, crowd, let our readers crowdsource them for interesting news nuggets so that we would be expanding the reporter pool and not having to go through it ourselves. But it's such a fire hose of information that you know it would behoove us to post and then read. Uh, and since it's public information, I don't think we would have much hesitation to do that. Uh, suppose we change the hypo a tiny bit. Sure. <laughs> and suppose Vince. You're the judge. No. <laughs> <laughs> suppose Vince, you have an informant, all right? 
and he comes to you on a confidential basis, and he says that he's got some powerful information about Derek, all right? But he's an informant. Uh, he's got a criminal record himself. Is there, from your point of view, or yours as well, is there a quantitative difference of, of permitting a video of him to be disclosed? Or are you now going to say, if you do that, I'll never have another informant come forward? Because it's one thing to go into the courtroom, quite another thing to be go viral that night and everybody on earth know I, that I testified against the buddy. So, just so I understand, Judge, so there's a, a video of him testifying at trial that they want to actually put out after the trial's over. Yeah. Um, yes, we would have a, obviously a substantial problem with that. Um, it would be, they could be in the courtroom, the courtroom would be open, I assume. It's gonna be open, sure. Okay, um, so it, they could hear what he says and actually you know, write down and literally report right after he's finished testifying. Yeah. But in terms of his, um, his face going up on <laughs> the television, it will quell and you know, prevent us from being able to use informants and people that will come forward as well. That's another issue that we have with respect to video as well. You gotta understand something. There is a view in DC, especially growing up in DC, that you don't necessarily yeah. cooperate with the police. And the reason is because there'll be <coughs> retribution and things may happen to you. So if we can, witness safety is of the utmost concern to us. So if we can prevent a video of someone testifying, mm -hmm. going out and just have them, maybe the journalist come in and listen to the video and take notes and then report on it that way, that is a much better way to, for us to keep the informant anonymous and secret, but also get them the information. And we've done that before. And our PIO, um, Bill Miller, works very closely with the media, and we've done that in a number of cases where they've asked mm -hmm. for the video. We've made, um, you know, we've had a hearing in front of the court, and we've actually agreed um, outside of court between the media and my office to allow them to come in and maybe watch the, 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 the video in camera, take notes, and then report on it outside of there. So um, the media has been very uh, reasonable with respect to our accommodations, and I think we've tried to accommodate their concerns as well. I, I hope they agree with me over there. I, I absolutely yeah. agree. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I mean, it's in, it's our, Peter could probably speak this much better than I can, <clears> but it's in our self-interest, <throat> too, to protect sources and informants to... Uh, lawyers can become informants to reporters down the road if you're out there, any informants. Um, so, you know, we're not in, you know, as much as we are in the business of getting as much news as possible out there, we recognize the trade-offs that come with our profession. So one thing we haven't talked about yet is how gruesome the shooting video might be. Does it matter to you how uh, graphic the video might be if you're yes. going to use it? Uh, we're, we're very careful about that. <clears throat> Often we have security video of a... Uh, store clerk being shot, we do not show that. We basically might show the scene right up until the time the pistol is shot. Uh, in many cases, in accident scenes and all these other things, we're very circumspect about what kind of gruesome stuff we'll put on the air. But this, this raises an interesting point. Um, totally different case, so I'm sorry <coughs> to deviate. But there was, about a couple years ago, a clearly insane person was leading the police on a car chase in Southern California and it lasted for about an hour and all the television and cable news were showing it and, and then he got out of his car and ran through some deserted desert-like place and then shot himself on live TV and Fox News famously didn't have the delay in place and they showed it live. And we had a debate in the newsroom about whether we, when we repurpose this video, should show that gruesome element and we decided not to but another... Uh, new site, uh, I'm not going to name them, they did. And their rationale was, everyone has seen this. It is every, it is literally everywhere. It's all over the internet. We all just watched it. Should we just ignore the fact that everyone has seen this? And, and it's a long way to go and say, it's a tough call. Uh, I understand exactly where he's coming from. I, we didn't run that video, but it's not that easy a call if everyone has literally seen it. And, and we've got to appreciate the permanence of this. It's a wonderful piece said about a month ago in the New Yorker by Tobin about this family. I don't know if you know the story, but the, their poor daughter was decapitated in a car accident, and it was picked up by a nearby video on a bank. That damn thing is on the internet. And Tobin tells the story of how this family for five years has been trying to get it down. And it's playing whack-a-mole because every time they try to get it down, that draws more attention to it. And he gets into this nice question of our society vis-a-vis -vis the European Union and this remarkable so-called right to be forgotten. So I'm very concerned about the permanence of this information. Five years from now, when this video is still out there, 
uh, and in this community, this guy is identified as an informant and a, and a snitch. All right, well, we Oddly are enough, oh. just very quickly, even when we try to take something off our websites, it's difficult to hide because yeah. there are all these different search engines for all these cached files in the, in the past. It's hard to take something off exactly. the Internet. So we are now at the end of our time, and we're ended at the end of our trial. I'm not going to say what the verdict was. I will let you all use your imagination and decide uh, how you think it turns out in the way that you like best. But the question for the judges is, does it matter to you what the verdict is? Would your decision about releasing evidence or making it available to the public depend on whether there's a guilty or not guilty verdict? No. I agree. And for the prosecutor, the defense lawyer, do you do your feelings change based on what the verdict is? I don't know if my feelings matter. I don't, I don't think I have any way to um, convince the judge to put a gag order in place to prevent this stuff from being released. Um, you know, if um, e either way, on behalf of my client, I'd prefer that this video not, you know, keep getting looped night after night. But uh, you know, my feelings probably don't matter. And I mean, I know it's going to sound cliche, but we want a just outcome. And if that is, and we will fight as hard as we can to prevent information from getting leaked that will make an impartial jury, you know, decide something and be persuaded um, by information that should not, they should not see. So, um, you know, I don't, the, the outcome is not that important as long as the trial was just and fair. Well, that's a great note to finish on. Thank you all so much. I want to invite June Crest to come up here with a couple final words. But thank you all. It's been super. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really want to thank our terrific panel, and especially to you, Ashley. Great job at moderating. Let's give them a, another round of applause. I also want to give a great thanks to our Benchmore Media Dialogue Committee. A number of you are here. If you could just stand and be recognized. You've done a great job at conceptualizing this very complex panel, and we thank you so much. And finally, I want to give a special shout out to Tracy Velasquez, who's our senior policy analyst, who uh, was highly involved in all of the details of putting this uh, panel together. Many, many moving parts. This was a pretty complex uh, assignment. And Tracy, great job. Also, Tracy was well assisted by our development de director, Amanda Townsend. So let's give them, both of them a round of applause. <laughs> The intersection of the media and the courts is just one of the many areas that the Council for Court Excellence has focused on over the last 32 years, from examining jury service here in the district to looking at school discipline issues to making policy recommendations that help returning citizens when they reenter the community from prison. The Council for Court Excellence and its board and staff and committee members are actively involved in improving the administration of justice in the D.C. area. And we want to encourage you to follow our work. We are now on social media. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. And I hope that you'll also consider supporting the Council for Court Excellence, either through volunteering on a committee, perhaps joining the board, or making a tax-deductible contribution. Tonight's panel has been videotaped. We're very, we're very pleased about that, and we'll be making the videotape available to all of you and to our uh, supporters on our mailing list. So thank you again for attending. We hope you get home safely, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very, very much.